Give me the muck for my girl. That's where my Good morning, and here we are once again. We're at the very lovely, not so sunny, but it is the snowy corner of Glenwood and Lunt. We're in the heart of Rogers Park. We're up here on the stage at the Heartland Cafe, where every Saturday morning we bring you another edition of the Live from the Heartland show. Good, good morning, morning, Michael. Good morning, Katie Hogan. How are you? Good, good. It's not as cold outside as they said, so come on out. Do not be afraid. It is still flipping winter, after all. Okay, just a quick, we've got a, a very literary show today you put together. Mike. I read all three books. You are such a show off. You're very good. <laughs> it's nice It's nice when you're semi-retired, you get to read. Um, okay, just quickly, this was the week that was. We are popeless at this moment. How does it feel? Oh, listen to that. Some people like that. Ah, you scoundrels out there. I hear there's a really good piece of uh, footage on, online this week that shows uh, Keith Ellison, the congressman who is not afraid to tell it like it is, getting Sean Hannity. I think you really need to watch that to make yourself feel better. So look it up. Keith Ellison, congressman, the only... Muslim in the in the uh, Congress. So he went he, off on Fox. He went off on Sean Hannity. He said evidently he said everything you've always wanted to say to him. So check it out. Uh, ultimately, um, the sequester, which has happened now, which means in fact there is more leadership, responsible and practicing, in our Park Advisory Council than there is in the Congress at this moment. Let's hear it for the Park Advisory Council. Yes. Shall we? And let's say that. Uh, Actually, this was the week that the, the blue bin recycling came to the 49th Ward. Ooh. And we've been waiting a long time because we are some environmentally conscious folks, and now we can do it right. No more blue bags. Yes, in fact, uh, if you want to get involved and be a good uh, recycling block captain here in the ward, there's a meeting that starts right after this show, 10, 10 a.m. in the Rogers Park Library meeting room, second floor. I'm going to be running over there because I want to be a good recycling block captain. Well, I'm going to hang out with our guests after the show. and let me, Let's tell people who we've got on the show. We're let's going to start off with uh, my old uh, football buddy, high school, junior high, Mark Smith, Mark Scott Smith. He's a retired doctor, worked in Chiapas in Guatemala, as well as up in the states of Washington, Oregon, etc. And he wrote a book called Enemy in the Mirror, Love and Fury in the Pacific War. And we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to move over to basketball. We're going to have uh, our old pal Russ Bradbird, who has a new book out called Make It, Take It. Uh, he's done this was his third book with basketball themes. And then we have Mike Lenahan, uh, formerly of The Reader and writes for The Atlantic. And he has a wonderful book out called Ramblers, Loyola Chicago 63 Team that changed the color of college basketball. So uh, stay tuned and uh, come on over if you get a chance. We've got lots of books. Meet the authors. They'll sign them, the whole deal. And tomorrow afternoon we will be here at the Heartland with Lenahan and Brad Bird, and it's called uh, Literary March Madness. It's two guys talking about their basketball books. Yeehaw. All right, let's, uh, let's welcome and say hello to Mark Scott Smith. Hello, Mark. Good morning. How are you? Thank you very much. Good. It's fun to be here in cold Chicago. Yeah, it's not that cold. We just came from Mexico at 97 degrees. Oh, it's cold then. He was then. in Merida. <laughs> oh, you were in Merida, yeah. one Working of my on favorite places book. in the yeah. world. When I first went to Merida, I climbed up on somebody's second story to do something, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, fun. And I looked around. This was '83. Every single rooftop had a had a windmill on it. Ah, uh, yes. But I know they don't now. No. I know they don't. But yeah. that was in '83. Yeah. All right. I read *Enemy in the Mirror* this week. *Love and Fury in the Pacific War*. You basically went from um, somewhere around 1943 or two um, to 46 in this book. Mm -hmm. 42. You, mm -hmm. 42 to 46, mm -hmm. and you went between uh, a place in Japan. Uh, one of the islands of, in northern Japan. Hokkaido. Hokkaido. And, and what was the name of the town? Hakodate. Hakodate. Yeah. And, and between that and west coast, northwest coast of America. Yes. And followed characters in those two places and how they viewed the war. Uh, yes. There's a number of surprising things to 
me as a U.S. citizen who was not alive at that time, including um, a bit of an attack on the U.S. soil. Now, that actually did happen. Yes. Um, fire, shots fired on, um, was it a train depot or uh, what was a the fork, facility? A fork up there in uh, Washington. Yeah. Uh, Washington I, uh, or Oregon? There were, there were three events that really intrigued me. I was at the University of Washington in Seattle and we retired to the Oregon coast and when we did I learned of these events. Uh, one of them was a long-range submarine from Japan came up and shelled the army fort right, out, right near Astoria, Oregon at night time and it wrecked the basketball court basically in the outside and didn't kill anybody. Wrecked the basketball court. <laughs> it's a, it's a theme. It's a theme, <laughs> folks. Right and then the, the same submarine came up again a couple of months later in the fall of 42 and launched this ingenious float plane that had been um, in a capsule inside of the submarine across the across the Pacific, and they firebombed the forest, trying to start a forest fire. Right. And then the third event was toward the end of the war, uh, 1945 in May, there was a balloon bomb. One of the balloon bombs that was sent from Japan to the United States lodged in a tree in southern Oregon, and a minister's wife and five teenagers were killed when they pulled on it. Oh my gosh. So those, those events really fascinated me, when I, and I started researching, and we traveled to all the places. And no. then I thought, what about the people on the Japanese submarine? Um, so I fictionalized characters, and one of them was a young man who was a junior officer on the submarine, Isaku. and he came from Hokkaido, because it's the mirror image of Oregon. Yeah. Yeah, and that was, uh, well, how, how does, uh, the, um, the conversations that people had about the war on both sides mirrored each other. Yes. Um, and, and the questions, uh, except for the, pos the, the unique American racism piece that is part of the war where um, you had your characters uh, correctly saying, you know, observing that all the Japanese Americans had disappeared from the village the town in in uh, Wash in Oregon, mm -hmm. where had they gone? Everyone seemed to know that they went to this, basically concentration camp in mm -hmm. Idaho or uh, mm -hmm. other p parts, and that people were hoping, the neighbors were hoping that their neighbors were being treated well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then, didn't a couple of them go further to say? Why aren't we doing this with the Italians and the Germans? Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. I think it's important to understand that there was a real hysteria in uh, America right following Pearl Harbor that was n rather irrational. And the thought was that, gee, now maybe there's going to be an invasion of the West Coast by the Japanese, which most um, military people think was technically not very feasible. But nevertheless, there was a lot of concern about that. And so all of the uh, Japanese Americans uh, were evacuated from the coast areas, basically inland. Um, and as you mentioned, there was no nothing similar done to uh, Italian or, or German uh, uh, people at that time. Right. Michael, what was your uh, what was your big thing about this book? I know you finished it long before I did. I just liked it, and I uh, I felt a uh, a lot of compassion coming from uh, both people on both sides. Uh, which, I, knowing Mark, I, I sense that uh, you know this was him speaking about his own concerns, uh, but that uh, you know they seemed like real people, and they uh, seemed concerned, and no one was really too big on the war. Right. Um, uh, I learned uh, more about Japan and the situation, and uh, I think you and I were talking before the show, and you uh, said, well, you know, we don't want to let the Japanese off too too easy. They were really rough on on the uh, Chinese and they're pretty biased on some stuff. Oh yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a little curious to know what drew you to wanting to write about this period. I mean, I go back <laughs> with you to the days of uh, we were learn list watching and listening to Bo Diddley and uh, you know, other blues musicians were like young kids and uh, uh, why you decided to uh, do this. I know you were uh, uh, an amateur radio kid Mm -hmm. And you, you had a, the call letters, I still remember them, W1ZTZ, Zanzibar, Tokyo, and Zanzibar, over and out, back in eighth grade when you'd be on the 
the radio. So I know you had yeah. some of this kind of war, military, <laughs> uh, technical here we stuff. Go. But what drew you to this this Hold topic? On a Michael ride here. Wee. <laughs> I. Well, my wife says it's because I was born in 1942, just as you yeah. were. Yeah, it's um, my favorite number. Uh, yeah, I, it's not that simple. I. <laughs> I've always been interested in international affairs. I was, as you know, American Field Service Exchange student one summer and right. so on. And then I spent my junior year in Germany in college and liked to travel. Um, but I was mostly interested in the kind of what other people feel about events, particularly historical events. It's always fascinated me. What would I have thought, you know, if I were maybe a young Japanese man in 1941? It's like if we were back in the yeah. old days where we have had slaves or yeah, on what exactly. side, yeah. You yeah. like to think we were above it, but. Yeah, exactly right. And then I, I think I just became very fascinated with that concept that, that we tend to demonize our enemies when we're in war. And some people say that's necessary. To be able to kill somebody, you have to depersonalize them and demonize them. Um, and so if you look at the uh, Pacific War, it was the most overtly racist kind of war that we had. Um, uh, up to that point. Yeah, up to that point, and, you know, at that point in time. Um, and it was the propaganda and so on was very clearly uh, racist without any really question from anybody. It's kind exactly. of interesting to think about it. So the, the enemy was characterized usually as buck uh, you know, big glasses, uh, vermin-like, you know, rat-like uh, character and so on. And I thought that was really fascinating. I imagine in Japan, you know, I mean, that's probably not really the way people saw themselves or what was happening at that Clearly. time. Clearly. Clearly. The other thing I want to make clear is I think everybody, if they really grow up in a country, they love their country and they want to protect their country. And even if you've got a crappy government, you still care about your country. And I think that's what these Japanese, a lot of the Japanese people I was trying to that portray. Came through. Or, that came through. There was yeah. a lot of, um, there was a lot of uh, quoting the uh, emperor or yeah. the, the teachings coming out to the people of Japan to bolster them and make yeah. them believe that this was an effort that was going to succeed even yeah. as it was going clearly down. not succeeding. Yes. Yeah. And people, uh, you know, in Japanese society, we always have, we do have some stereotypes about how polite and, yes. you know, uh, the, just they have a, a lot more thoughtful and quiet presence than we boisterous Americans mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to some extent you you uphold that stereotype in terms of I people people saying yeah. okay yes um, whatever the Emperor says and we hope for a glorious victory and the rising Sun mm -hmm. yada yada mm -hmm. yada even while without saying it mm -hmm. together they are just in mourning over the loss yeah. of everything yeah their people they're they're beautiful you had some themes running through you you always commented on the birds yeah. <laughs> um, and I wanted to know if you're a birder. <laughs> I'm not. I just He like confessed this. that he had to look up a lot of that stuff. Cause I, looked, I, was I looked up Well, I should hope so. The flora, the fauna, you know, yeah. you had all these details. And I said, oh, man, this guy knows a lot of stuff. Well, yeah, and you also had a lot of details about certain weaponry used yeah. in the Second World yeah. War. And also the land uh, mass of, for example, Okinawa. Yeah, yeah. You knew it was a rock. Right. Uh, you know, that you did a lot of research. Well, the research, I got to say, the research for me was really a lot of fun. I love doing research. I'm so glad uh, to hear that as yeah. a soon-to-be writer. <laughs> you know, my job, uh, my academic job before I retired was a, a uni at the university teaching pediatrics and we did clinical research, medical research, and a lot of the skills that I learned were about how to assess information, be critical, and evaluate things, and I totally applied that to the book and it worked great. You know, I spent lots of time, lots of it online, but we also traveled to these places. We went to Japan a couple of times. We traveled all over the Oregon sites. I would go look at all the airplanes and weapons and so on and study them so that I understood them better. And then I got contacts. I found a pretty good contact in each area that was an expert. Like I'd find some old Air Force guy that could tell me about this, some Army guy could tell me about that. And uh, I'm finding that just fascinating. Yeah. You know, th there was an inequality in your book. Um, while you quoted the Emperor of Japan, you almost never, except for the front piece of the um, he got chapters, Roosevelt in there. he got Roosevelt yeah. in there a couple times, but they were more often they were um, MacArthur types or army yes. leaders of mm -hmm. the military in the U.S. And it didn't seem like the people over on the West Coast were quite as influenced, and I think it's correct, mm -hmm. at, by what was going on in D.C. Mm. as the people in Hokkaido mm. were influenced by Tokyo. Mm. You that know may, what I'm saying? That may be true. I hadn't thought about that before, but that's Just that a little true. bit, but yeah. I think it's correct. Yeah. I, I, yeah. You know, we're a, we're a lot bigger and more yeah. spread out. I'm going to butt in here, and uh, I'm going to ask you, Mark, to tell us w where people can get the book 
and um, maybe a quickie on your next project, and then I want to talk a little bit about uh, actual medical care, particularly children in the third world, and we'll focus on Chiapas. Okay. All that um, in four minutes. Yeah. This book is uh, well done. This is a self-published book on Create Space, Amazon. And uh, if you go on Amazon and you look for Enemy in the Mirror, or Love and Fury, the Pacific War, you'll find it quite easily. And there's a Kindle version of it as well. The next book I'm working on, uh, this is where we just came back from Merida because of, is going to be about a uh, Mexican-American pilot uh, beginning at McCord Base in, uh, in, uh, or in Washington, going to uh, Jacksonville, Florida, and then ending up in uh, Merida, Mexico. Um, it's going to be during 1942, during the time when everything was going down for us. We were losing on both fronts, and it looked ominously not a good outcome. So I'm fascinated by that time, and that's what I'm writing about, also from the point of view of a Mexican-American pilot. Wow. Good it's going to be called Enemy in the Mirror. I'm sorry, it's going to be called, <laughs> that's the first one. It's going to be called, Are You a Friend? Eres Amigo. Eres Amigo. Uh -huh. Good morning. Well, you, uh, you know, over the last few years, so a number of years, I've, uh, we've been in touch off and on, and I know you've spent some time um, in India, you spent some time in uh, Chiapas, a little in Guatemala. You are a pediatrician by trade, or I guess by learning, etc. And um, tell us a little bit about your work in Chiapas and the status of healthcare for kids, particularly in the third world. Okay. Quick. 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 <laughs> we, we started, we first went to India, it was like it was 93. And all I can say about India was I was on fire. I had never known how fascinating third world medicine would be. Um, we worked with Indian doctors and it was just a blast. And so when we came was that? Back. That when was in 93, I think. Uh. And then, correct me if I'm wrong. And then we came back um, and looked for a place where we could go because India is pretty far away. Yes, and it is. And just saw an ad that said Chapas. 